Welcome to this other edition of The Notebook on this uh, Friday, April 5th. I'm Marc-Antoine Galin with Arpin Basu. Uh, Arpin, uh, Canadians have a day off today. I hope that this is going to be enough for Caden Gooley to uh, figure things out physically and be ready to go on Saturday against Toronto. Yeah, well, listen, the last time Caden Gooley got hurt, we thought he was going to be out for a while. He wasn't. So he didn't make, actually didn't miss any time at all. So, or yeah. barely any. So, um, let's hope for his case, for his sake, rather, that that's the case here. Um, but, you know, I think we saw, well, first of all, I want to talk about the hit he took from Kucherov because I seem to be in the minority of people who thought that hit wasn't that bad. And maybe a two for boarding, but I, I don't even think it, it merited that. And I really thought it was, it was Gouli who should have been more prepared to take that hit than Kucherov was wrong to deliver it. Um, I felt it's a hit that you see very often, even though Kucherov clearly saw Gouli's numbers and saw them for a while. You see that hit eight to 10 times in a game, I think. Typically, it's just finishing a hit, which it just turned out badly. But it, I don't know. I'd like to get your take on it because I feel like yeah, I got, not, a, lot of, uh, I got uh, a lot of pushback on that. <laughs> right. No, I don't have much issue against that hit. I thought that there was a there was a boarding call against Evans that should have been called a lot more mm -hmm. than than that yes. hit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's also Struble that I think he was speared by by Sorelli during a scrum in front of the net. You know, those yeah. are. That was not that was not a great night of officiating by any stretch. No, but this call in no. particular. No, I I think there's an Gouli Gouli is on the receiving end of a lot of hits, and mm -hmm. I think that there's he, he needs to figure out ways to better protect himself. There's no doubt about it because there's been numerous occasions where you feel as though whether it's the head, whether it's the elbow, the the shoulders or whatnot, he. He seems to be in vulnerable positions. Um, and I wonder to which extent his body frame has something to do with it. Because he's a tall guy. Uh, he wants to play a, a rather you know physical brand of hockey when he can. But he has not filled up physically. And I wonder to which extent this might make him injury prone until he fills up and he's totally mature physically you know it may be in the mid to late 20s but for the time being in the shorter term I, I sometimes I, i look at him thinking yeah it's it's i don't know if he wants to stay lean because he wants to make sure that he keeps all of his agility or, or he wants to that's a decision that he makes based on the ice time that he gets i don't know But he's certainly not the guy, the type of guy that has chosen to to bulk up really. So since he's he's, he's tall, I feel like his upper body sometimes is uh, is getting hit a lot, and it it puts him. I wouldn't say injury prone, but it is puts him at risk though. Yeah, I don't I don't know, but I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. I think his I think what he's I think what he grew accustomed to in junior was being able to take those hits and to keep on going. And listen, it's not as if he was hit by Matt Rempe or even Austin Watson. You know, I mean, he was hit by Nikita Kucherov. Like, and mm -hmm. I think part of that, I think I, I pin on awareness. Like maybe if it was Austin Watson bearing down on him, he would have been more prepared for that hit. Maybe he just didn't expect Kucherov to finish that hit, even though he should, because Kucherov regularly does stuff like that. Um, So, yeah, I think it, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about with Slav last year, you know, how he just, he didn't have the same level of awareness because he just didn't, he just didn't have that element of the game in Europe and wasn't accustomed to it. Now, Gouli did have that in the Western Hockey League, uh, but, and I think he's getting better at it in the NHL level, but I think last night was just an instance of him lacking a bit of awareness and just mm -hmm. knowing that he's about to get hit. Um, and I feel like if he did that, 
um, he probably would have come out of that hit just fine. It just seemed like the the possibility of being hit in that situation didn't seem to register with Boolean. And, you know, I, I can get the argument from people that Kucherov sees numbers all the way and still hits him, and yeah, that's, yeah. that's boarding. I, I get that, but I just feel like that's – even though that's technically true, that's a hit we see very, very commonly in NHL games. Uh, Josh Anderson laid a hit just like that. Not long after, um, it's 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 finishing your hit, and I don't I don't see it as a typical boarding situation where you know I feel like Kucherov just rubbed him out against the boards, kind of as opposed to boarding him. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think I think Gouli does need to up his awareness, and maybe and maybe there's something to the the physical maturity part of it as well. But one thing's for sure is that as soon as Gouli left that game, the Canadians got completely discombobulated and had like their worst <laughs> period we've seen. Yeah. in weeks and so this was something the canadians were doing quite regularly um earlier in the season is putting together a good 40 minutes and having a bad 20 minutes cost them games um we hadn't seen that in a while uh so that's what i think made it somewhat jarring and i remember speaking to yol armia after the game who we'll get to in a bit here but you know, that's what he was really upset about that. Like, he's like, that's, we haven't played a period like that in such a long time. We felt we had put that behind us. So it's just really disappointing that we played that second period the way we did. And, 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 you know, honestly, before it was not only just a period of the game, it was often the second period of a game that the Canadians did this in. Um, so it was disappointing that we did that again and just kind of reverted back to, uh, what we were doing in the past. And Marty, Martin St. Louis after the game said, I think it's a one-off. We haven't done that in a while, but I don't think it's a coincidence that that bad second period coincided with losing Caden Gooley late in the first period. And yeah, having, that was actually early in the, in the first, or period. early in the first period. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, really but still it's, the yeah. His absence, I feel was extremely noticeable. Um, and had kind of a trickle down effect on a lot of guys who, who were kind of playing out of their element because Gouley's minutes needed to be taken up. And, and so in a way, I think we have, we got kind of a sneaky sort of look at how important Gouley is to this, to this team already at his yeah. age. Yeah. Well, he missed, uh, obviously he missed a game, uh, earlier a few days before because of his one game suspension he was mm -hmm. replaced by Kovacevic in the lineup so they were playing 6d yesterday once he was gone they were down to 5ds and and it was really Jordan Harris that was the main beneficiary of that I mean he mm -hmm. played north of 24 minutes uh in a game where David Savard I would suppose was I mean he, he did not did not hit the 20 minute mark Maybe that has got something to do with the fact that the Canadians were playing catch-up hockey. But mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, Martin St. Louis was asked about the fact that he was scratching Kovacevic repetitively, and he acknowledged the fact that Struble and Harris really had taken positive steps and, and are really now – they've separated themselves. Separated the, themselves, yeah. Yeah, on the, on the depth chart. So it's interesting, and I think that seeing the vote of confidence that – Harris got yesterday after Gouli uh, uh, was out of the game was really a testament of that. But you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, Gouli, I don't know if we can call him a, a quarterback, a general, or even a top-pairing defenseman at this point, but he's a crucial part of what the Canadians' blue line is today and what it will be in the future. Uh, and it's it's going to be... There's such a nice balance I, I find in his play and, and such maturity that he has gained even over the course of this second season. There has been some there's been some lows at times, but I find that the level of consistency that that he's that he's showing is uh, and poised to is is very interesting uh, and very compelling for the future. So missing him, yeah, it did put a some pressure on the other guys. Uh, Matthew uh, Matheson obviously played a ton, 28 minutes, and it it was really not one of his best games. He, he fought no, with not, the puck. Not very, not very clean, no. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. So it's uh, – but you're right. I mean, what do you think uh, 
let's say okay we we cannot we cannot speculate on how long if 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 Ghoulie's got anything at all or not mm -hmm. we don't know last time but, we did that we were completely wrong so, <laughs> we were yeah yeah we were but it, i mean it's uh how would you characterize the place that he holds on this blue line right now well i just feel he's a stabilizing influence you know like like matheson's the one who eats all the minutes but still plays a bit of a, a wild game kind of like i mean he's he's really uh you know it's kind of the opposite of a calming influence and <laughs> like it's it's and Kane Gooley I feel is that calming influence and and really just the steadiness in his game really helps um and the fact that he's so you know it's kind of what D David Savard brings but Savard brings it without the mobility uh Gooley adds the mobility and so mm -hmm. you know Jack is kind of the opposite again like he's He's not a calming influence. He he's all over the place, and and some nights, you know, last night I think was another example where you're not really sure what you're going to get from him in the defensive zone, but he makes things happen. He's physical. He lays big hits. He, he has some offensive tools that he can use. But Guli is really that all around steady, uh, steady guy who can just who just stable. He's a stabilizer, and you know the more. The more I watch him this season, uh, playing on the right side, um, which I are, I really have – I know the circumstances have made it, so that has to happen, and, and it's a good feather in Gouli's cap going forward that he's able to do it. But I just feel like uh, it's 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 not ideal, and I, I'm not I'm – I'm against it, really, that he's played so much on the right side this season. You're against um, it? I am kind of, I don't, I, I think it was fine for, for like, you know, 10 games, 15 games, yeah. but it's been so long. It's been nearly half the season where he's been on the right side. It's like, it's, you know, I don't know if it, he's not, I don't feel he's going to play the right on it, it, going forward. Like he should be playing the side he's going to play. Um, yeah. but again, it doesn't bother Gooley. In fact, he likes having this tool. Um, it's, it's not been. He doesn't see it as a hindrance, so maybe I shouldn't either, but I just feel like sometimes, you know, the player is not the best, you know, Kim Gooley's not going to complain about playing on the, he's playing in the NHL. He's happy to be playing in the NHL and that's it. He's not, so anyhow, it's not a huge issue, but I just feel in an ideal world, you'd have him back on the left side. Uh, but he, he, you know, the stabilizing impact of him, uh, is really, I think going to be his number one trait going forward and just kind of got me thinking like, you know, is Caden Gooley in his prime a, a lock to be a top pair defender? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe. I think he will be. Um, but I kind of see him in, in sort of the Jay Bomeister kind of way. Like Jay yeah. Bomeister was obviously an excellent skater didn't produce that much offensively despite having seemingly all the tools to be sort of an offensive difference maker was really solid defensively uh, and was that stabilizing influence and, and, and impacted games with that mobility. And I think like Caden Gooley in a best case scenario would probably be like him and Canes I think would be thrilled if he, if he was like that, you know I mean? Jay Bomeister was an excellent defenseman for a very long time, but you know, I don't know if, either him or David Reinbacher or any of the other multitude of defensive prospects the Canes have in their stable, even, even Lane Hudson. I mean, it's, I don't think there's anyone that you can look at and say that guy is a surefire top pair defender. Like it's, it's like no doubter top pair defenseman. I mean, no. So yeah, I think we can... yeah th there's a couple of things I'd like to say about that. First, the, when sure. you compare, um, First, going back on the, the the left side, right side thing. I mean, unless Reinbacker and Logan Mayu play in Montreal next year, the Canadians would have to acquire a right-handed defenseman to avoid playing Gouli on the right side again. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is really a decision 
that they'll have to make. And so I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know for a fact that they're going to go after a, a veteran defenseman, but if, if I would not presume that Ryan Backer and Mayu will both play in Montreal from day one next year. So no. I think we'll see, we're going to continue to see Gouli on the right side, most likely uh, for the next little while. I think Har- but Harris becoming basically a right D at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But is- he's, but he, that, that would be, yeah, that would be probably your, your, a th- your third, a third pairing your, guy, you know? Right. So, and you don't, do you want to have Mayu or Ryan Backer as top four right from the get go? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and so, but it's tricky because the depth, the short term depth is on the left and the long term depth is on the right to mm-hmm. a certain extent. But I mean, they're going to be stacked on both, both sides. Let's not kid ourselves. And I guess that transitions to that second point. You're totally right. I'm not sure that there's any surefire first pairing defensemen in their current group. Um, I would picture Gouli as a guy who would be a, a, a top pairing guy, depending on who's the guy that plays with him. But in terms of being able to log a ton of minutes and being like the again the stabilizing guy on the duo, let's say, let's say it would be he was to play on the right side and Lane Hudson blossoms into like this offensive defenseman that everybody dreams he can become. Uh-huh. Well, down the road, that's that's a potential first pair, possibly. I mean, if if you put Lane Hudson to the absolute, you know, if he reaches his his ceiling in the at the NHL level, but there are doubts on all of those guys in terms of you know what they can be uh, as first pairing material. But they have such a interesting depth uh, among their 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 blue line uh, prospects that I wouldn't be surprised if they say, okay, we might not have the, the high end guy, but we could certainly have the equivalent of three second pairs. And you look at a team Mm -hmm. like Carolina, they've got Burns, they got Brady Shea, they got Jacob Slavin, they got Brett Pesci. uh, They've got Orlov. Orlov. So everybody plays pretty much the same. Nobody plays 22 Mm -hmm. minutes. Orlov, is playing 17 minutes, which is a luxury. <laughs> I mean, on yeah. the third pair, uh, so they've got five guys that are playing between roughly 17 and 21 minutes. And I think this is down the road, barring the fact that you've got one of those young guys that really stands out and becomes like that bona fide number one defenseman. At least the potential of those different guys, and the fact that when you put together Gouli. Jack Eye, Reinbacker, Mayu, and Hudson, those five guys in particular mm-hmm. have very, very different skill sets, very complementary, and no two defensemen really fit the same profile. So it's really interesting. Maybe that you could say that Gouli and Reinbacker, maybe they'll have something in common in terms of the all around smooth, yeah. poised play. That's probably the biggest comparison that I would put, that, that, that I would make, but they, they I feel like there's a variety there that makes it very um, convenient to really establish uh, a top six on defense where you spread out the goods, you spread out the minutes, and you're well served no matter which pairings on the ice. Yeah, yeah. I would, it kind of comes back to the, the strong, weak, strong link, weak link theory. <laughs> we, right? never got like, out of, we never get out of it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, and I think – you know, the Carolina example is a good one. And I think generally, like, yeah, if you have six second pairing defensemen, six top four defensemen, basically, on your defense. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty good defense group. And and so, yeah, I think it, it begs the question, do you need that, that top minute munching guy who plays 26, 27 minutes a night when you – can have a third pairing that you could throw out for 18 minutes and, and put them out against anyone and feel perfectly comfortable. And, and frankly, probably helps you come playoff time uh, to be able to do that. Uh, first of all, you avoid the wear and tear of the regular season. Second of all, matchups become far less of an issue. Mm-hmm. If you have full confidence in all three of your D pairs, I mean, look at the situation now, like basically the Canadians can't put their fourth line out on the road, at least 
without Matheson and Gouy behind them, right? Like they have, they, they, they don't do it. Um, at home, it's obviously a little different. You get to see what the other team puts out there, but on the road, when you're throwing the fourth line out, you kind of know that chances are actually Tampa was a great example of this when the Canes were in Tampa recently. I don't know if, I don't know if that Colin white line played a shift without Matt Sanguli behind them because John Cooper invariably put out point Kucherov. And at the time it was, it was Stamkos. They didn't have declare yet. So, um, you know, that's, that's what having those D gives you. But if you have six of those, you don't have to do that. You don't have to consistently put those two out behind your fourth and your first lines to do double duty. Um, and so, yeah, it's for those who don't know the strong link and weak link theory, it's basically the, the it's a kind of a game theory that was kind of developed in, in soccer, football, European football, where, you know, it's, it's, it's the notion that certain sports – you're a better team if your worst player is better than the other team's worst player. Whereas in other sports, like in basketball, for instance, you're a better team if your best player is better than the other team's best player. That's that's close to what that's that's what we're yeah. talking about. So yeah. um but yeah, I mean I think that like like just on Reinbacher, you know, he's still so such a raw product and and i think this is a conversation i can i can share it's just you know i went to go see him his debut in laval last week um and that was his fifth game i think for for the rocket in uh in eight days uh wound up playing six and nine the next day and so i talked to a couple of scouts who saw him that night saw him play in belleville earlier that week and and you know one of them kind of said you know, I think he could probably use some more time in the AHL, uh, mm-hmm. but, you know, would have – will probably play in the NHL at some point next season. I had another one who just was like, no, this guy, this guy, this guy could play in the NHL right now. And, and like, you know, I asked him just, you know, I was writing about sort of Ryan Becker's skill set combined with – some of the high pressure teams the Canadians had faced of late, you know, um, Carolina being the most recent one. And I, I asked the scout about it and he's like, Oh, Rhinebacker. And then he just, his eyes lit up. He just went bing, bing, bing with his hands. He's like, <laughs> like, a, like, and making just like a little passing motion with his hands. And he's like, man, that guy, that guy picks out a guy and he, the puck is on his stick and it's off. And that is just like, it just has massive value. And I would have no problem with him starting the year in the NA. That guy, that guy's that guy's ready from that point of view, from a puck moving standpoint. And so, mm-hmm. um, and really, like that's something you saw all of Reinbacker's draft year, even this year, on a, playing on a team that never had the puck. His ability to identify quickly, identify who should get the puck next, and deliver that puck to that player on his tape is a really, really strong attribute of this kid. I don't want to call it elite yet because we haven't really seen it at the NHL level, but I feel like he's one of those guys that's going to adapt well to playing with NHL players because he's able to, uh, you know, he kind of knows where people are supposed to be on the ice. And I think a lot of times in Switzerland, they just weren't there. (laughs) And so he had to hold on to the puck a little longer, but once he has very predictable routes to play with, he's a guy who's going to find those players skating those routes. So so yeah, but, he, he might be one of those guys who who plays better with better players, you know. Yeah, and for whom I think so. the NHL will be a better an easier league to play in. Yeah, probably because you know everyone describes the AHL as scrambly, you know, and and that's kind of like those two scouts I spoke with. Like that was kind of my my line of questioning was, you know, how do you identify, how do you account for the fact that a player has a very high hockey IQ, but is playing in an environment where the hockey IQ is lower and how that impacts his ability to play in that environment. And that's one of them just turned to me and said, well, that's exactly what he said. That's a really good question. And, and it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to account for, but you have to, like, it's just, you just have to, it's just hard to see that. And you don't, you won't see that until you put that player in an NHL environment. 
And I asked Marty St. Louis the same question. He brought up Jaden Struble, like, and, and he said, you know, you won't know, you won't face pressure like this until you face it here. Cause nowhere, there's nowhere else in the world where you play under this kind of pressure. I'm talking about forechecking pressure, not media pressure or whatever other pressure you can think of, like actual hockey pressure on the puck. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, Jaden Struble, we didn't know how he was going to do. And then he got here and he performed remarkably well and, and better than we thought. And so, you know, I think there's going to be, it's going to be an interesting training camp, you know, but I mean, as far as Ryan Backer's first pairing potential, yes, he has first pair potential. Is he a lock to be like a really good top pairing defenseman? I don't know if he is, you know, it's, 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 he could just be a really kind of high end, as we were saying before, top four defensemen. And if, if you have six of them, then you're looking good. Can you hear, can you hear that? Can you hear, this is the sound. Oh yeah, I hear it. This is the sound of all those fans who are saying, you don't spend a top five pick on a second pairing defenseman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. I don't think – well, so I guess that could – the question, this does beg the question, right? I mean, if, if do you need top-pair defensemen if you have six second-pairing defensemen? Do you need – and and if the Canadians have an opportunity to draft a top-pairing defenseman, which I'm not sure they will – like a, like a surefire top-pair defenseman, I don't think that that player will be available – To them when they mm -hmm. when they draft unless they win the lottery obviously um so but there's no, there's no i'm not sure if there's a clear-cut guy you know there, there there's plenty of good defensemen available in this year's draft yeah but the list from one team to another and their assessment of who the best defenseman is will greatly change oh for sure it's a total so, it's a total wild card this so year. it's not like you can pinpoint so, oh yeah that guy that guy is you know That guy's Kale McCarr, you know. Yeah. There's, it's it's really a matter. It's very subjective, uh, and open to 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 questioning. Um, you mentioned Struble. It's it's interesting because the, I thought that Tampa played a rather abrasive type of hockey uh, yesterday, and mm -hmm. the Panthers on Tuesday even more so. And I'm thinking, you know, if Struble is still around in a few years and he holds his own you know holds a spot on that blue line with struble jack eye Gouli, and and mayu uh -huh. who really has a lot of fu in his game yes uh again potentially down the road i think that it's a blue line also that could match up against the more sandpaper teams and they mm -hmm. could they could initiate the sandpaper aspect in the game. Right. Uh, so that's really a part of that, that blue line that really uh, draws my attention and, and my hopes for the future too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And especially the combination of Jack Kai and Mayu who, who <laughs> on top of being sort of having an FU attitude are, are just, you know, seem to relish being together in Laval and just yapping. At guys yeah. like just really chirping guys and uh because knowing that they can back it up right and so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it'll it, and it's honestly it makes for a big group on defense like mm -hmm. if you have although struble it's it's hard to see where he would fit unless he transitions to the right side which he could do in theory but it's uh you know if you have Ryan is big too, you know. He's well, not that's it. Ryan Backer's big. So if you have if you have Jackai, Mayu, Ryan Backer, Gooley, and I don't know who else, but I mean it really insulates wow. Hudson, right? I mean yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's no matter who it know, is. I mean whether I mean, it's I mean, we still shouldn't, around or we shouldn't completely write off Justin Barron. I mean he hasn't even been brought up here, but it's yeah. although I think I think he needs to show something pretty soon. He's gonna he's waiver eligible next year and uh Those scouts I spoke to were not very impressed with his how he's been doing in Laval. It's like it's kind of he, he needs to take a step here pretty soon yeah. to to re re kind of establish himself in this group. But it's uh, it's definitely a big, mobile, balanced group, and I don't know if the Canadians 
necessarily need a clear cut top pairing guy, a guy who stands above the rest. Um, if that, if your group has such a high floor, you know, like that's, that's yeah. really it. But what is, you know, what is a number one defenseman really as, is it a, it is, do you qualify it by the number of points that he makes? Is it just by sheer talent or the number of minutes that he plays? Because right now, Mike Matheson is by default a number one defenseman because of how much he plays. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's um, among that group, depending on the opponent, uh, depending on how they fare at a certain time, any of those kids could be the one, you know, taking the lion's share and be the one playing more and reaching 24, 25, 26 minutes on any given night. You know, it, mm -hmm. could, it could move from one guy to the other. So, Well, that's the beauty of having a group like that. Like the, yeah. the way that, you know, it could, it could change whoever's feeling it that night gets the lion's share of the minutes. Yeah, because there's not... There's not 20 Miro Iskanen and 20 Adam Fox in, in, in the league. You know, there's yeah. the, those, those type of defensemen, they're 10 or 12 uh, that are really at, at an upper echelon. And after mm -hmm. that, it's, it's, it's tricky to get there, but I'm, it's certainly not well, it's, an area of concern because even though some of those guys might not hit, they've got enough in that pool to make two to make sure that they can fill that top six and probably move one or two guys more. So Yeah, definitely actually they they have to move one or two guys more. They really don't have a choice. I mean it's it's they they're they're they have too many you because you know if you say that there's 12 guys who could show up at training camp next year and think they have a chance of making the team, mm -hmm. that's already too many because you're not gonna fill Laval with six young guys on defense. Like it's just not and you're not gonna have six young guys on defense. Or well, actually no. It's, it's yeah, because that includes like that 12 would include Matheson and Savard, right? And so you're not gonna send the six young guys who get cut and say, okay, you're the you're our defense group in Laval. It doesn't work that way. You need some some veteran presence on defense in Laval as well. And so then, yeah. so then you have too many, then you, then you, then you have some runoff there. So yeah, they're going to need to. And I, I think the Canadians have every intention of doing that this summer is, is, is using some of their depth on defense to go address their depth up front. And I don't think Ken Hughes has made any effort to hide that. I think it's, yeah. it's clear. It's obvious when you look at the organizational depth chart that you need to take a little bit from pile B and, address pile a with it. And so, uh, but you know, it's, it's interesting debate because, you know, like it's, you look at what Quinn Hughes is doing in Vancouver. Like you look at the top defensemen around the league and, you know, you, you would hope to, to have a guy like, like, like that driving the bus, you know, of course, uh, um, like the Norris trophy vote this year is becoming complicated. McCarr is kind of <laughs> having a bit of an off year, but Roman Yossi has, has almost single-handedly dragged the Predators into the playoffs over the last 25 or so games. And it's really probably more of a Hart Trophy argument than a Norris. I think Quinn Hughes is, is but, you know, I just don't feel the Canes have a guy like that. Kel McCarr's got 82 points in 71 games. If, if that is an off year, I'll take an I off year every yeah. year. Oh, yeah, he's definitely generating <laughs> points. I think defensively he's had – Some issues. Uh, his penalty killing has been a little off, I think. But yeah, he's obviously he's, he's Kael McCarr. He has he still has his feet. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna make yeah, things yeah, happen, you know. Sure. So it's but and you know I think well I think you know I don't think it's out of the question, and I actually think it's gonna happen. Like Lane Hudson's gonna produce a lot of points in this league. I'm pretty convinced of it. I, I don't think the body of work is too much at this point. And every time he's elevated a level, it has not stopped him. Everyone's still waiting for the level that's going to stop Lane Hudson. And it hasn't happened yet. It's very similar to Cole Caulfield in the sense that everyone always thought, oh, he'll go there. That's when he'll stop scoring. Oh, no. Look, he set the US NTDP scoring record. Oh, yeah. oh he'll go to the AHL and he's going to get roughed up. No, nope. he's scoring goals at will and he barely spends any time there and he goes to the NHL. Oh, the NHL is not going to get that. Well, no. Nope. Sorry, he's going to score. Although he's, you know, and his, him, his down year this year, he scored his 22nd goal last night. Like, it's not, and it, you know, he's he's 22 years old. Yeah. It's like, and he's number 22. And, you know, he likes that Taylor Swift song for that reason. So, but anyhow, it's, um, 
it's it's not it's that's his down year. It's a pretty good yeah. down year, you know. Like I mean, yes, it's not thirty five, forty goals, and I think that's what he envisions. Actually, he envisions himself scoring way more than that, but it's still a good down year for Cole Caulfield. You know, I mean, it's 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 not the number he wants. So, in any in all that all that to say that I think their defense can be made up of a lot of high floor guys, you know, and, yeah. and even Lane Hudson. And I think I'm, I'm convinced that he's might, might not be right away, but at some point he's going to produce a lot of points in this league and he's going to be good enough defensively and will be surrounded by good players defensively that, that he can, that he can hold his own on that end of the ice and figure out as he has his whole life, you know, figure out how to defend at his size. Uh, he's a strong kid despite his size. So, yeah. but yeah, I think uh, uh, we'll see. And maybe he'll become that play driving number one ish defenseman with all the power play minutes he'll get and what have you. Maybe he'll get up to 24, 25 minutes a night eventually. But, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of with you that maybe the Canadians don't necessarily need that guy with the group that they have. No. And we're, but again, it's, it, it's a few years down the road because for now, mm-hmm. Matheson is still around. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that until the end of the season, Struble and Harris are really under the spotlight, you know, and it's, it's their time to showcase themselves and say, don't, don't scratch us off in mm-hmm. favor of those, you know, up and coming defensemen. We're, we're very much part of the equation here. Yeah. That's, I, I, th- I think this is, that's the chance that they're being given. So uh, uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see in the last uh, 10 games or so um, if they're going to be able to seize that opportunity. Uh, but, you know, it could be, yeah, it could be a very well-balanced uh, blue line. You mentioned Quinn Hughes and Vancouver. Quinn Hughes plays like close to 25 minutes, but uh-huh. the number six defenseman is uh, is playing uh, less than 15 minutes a night, and that's uh, Noah Jolson. Yeah. Noah Jolson is a former Montreal Canadiens prospect, Mm -hmm. uh, is one of the candidates for the Masterton Trophy Ah, this year. Yes. Uh, There is also Michael McCarron, another Mm -hmm. name from uh, the uh, Nashville Predators, another former Canadiens who's a Masterton nominee. Jonathan Drouin, former Montreal Canadiens. (laughs) And we voted uh, for Yoel Armia. Uh, We went at... We went at length about what he went through and what he's been able to overcome. So uh, let's try not to really uh, repeat ourselves too much. But I think that it's uh, it was really fitting, knowing that this would be announced in the morning, that he scored two goals against the Lightning, mm-hmm. uh, matched his career high for goals. And it's uh, it's really he, he's really a deserving candidate um, to, to for – For that award, he might. There are super interesting cases league wide. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm. I don't think that. I don't think that Armia is going uh, as a real chance of winning that award, but it's a nice tip of the cap because to to uh, tip of the cap to him because uh-huh. among the Montreal Canadiens is clearly the story that stands out in terms of perseverance. Um, uh, you know, to his craft and and. Yeah, it, it, he seems like a logical choice for a Masterton nomination. Yeah, and um, it's funny. Uh, actually, our colleague Eric Engels made a good point last night. Is that we didn't vote for Sean Monahan because he didn't spend enough time here, uh, and our colleagues in Winnipeg didn't vote for Sean Monahan because he didn't spend enough time there. Uh, but yeah. really, had he been on the list of candidates, I think Sean Monahan would have a good chance of winning the award. You know, I mean, it's like it's really. Yeah. Um, really come back from, you know, some devastating physical injuries. And, and I always had, you know, our former colleague, Francois Le Menu, uh, I sat next to him at the Bell Center Press Box, you know, covered the Canadians for a long time for La Presse Canadienne, venerable yeah. kind of colleague, wise, you know. Venerable and, uh, is definitely the right Yes, word. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and so I remember talking to him once about the Master 10 Trophy, And he said, um, I don't understand why we give it to guys who are coming back from injuries because what are these guys going to do? Like, what are they going to do other than come back? What else yeah. do they know? Like, why would they just leave the game they love and they've worked their entire lives to make? 
what other option do they have? And so I always try to think of that when I vote for the Master Tin Trophy and, and, and not only the local candidate, but the actual trophy itself yeah. is what option did these guys have? Like, and, and I look at Armia and when he was sent to Laval, like he's going to get paid anyway, right? He had two years left on his contract at that point, this one and next one. Could have gone to Laval and said, you know what? Screw it. I'll go through the motions here. I'll collect my paycheck. And then when I'm done, I'm done. Yeah. And that was a real option for him. You know, like it's, but he did the opposite of that. And what's really commendable is just the rave reviews he got for his attitude when sent to Laval, not once, but twice. And so I always have that Le Menu bar in my head. Like, what what else was this guy supposed to do? Uh, so, you know, and in Monaghan's case, it kind of applies, but it's it's because he, he wasn't just going to end his career just because he had, um, just because he had, you know, sort of, hip surgery on both hips and like he, he was still in his twenties. Like there was no reason for him to quit playing hockey. No. Um, and, but, and I guess to some extent, to some extent, you also didn't have a reason to quit playing hockey, but he could have taken that demotion to Laval much differently than what he actually did. So. Yeah. When you, when you look at a guy, for example, without the idea of collecting your paycheck, I, I, I think of Carl Alsner when he was sent down to Laval uh back in a few years ago uh-huh. uh he did not take the attitude of saying i'll just collect my paycheck and he, he w- very much wanted and hoped to be called up and have another crack at it on the montreal blue line also had an excellent attitude about it also yeah exactly yeah. but i think that the, the 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 approach or the um epiphany that came to to Yoel Armia to finally unlock his potential really stands out. To me, it's it's a type of story that I'm not sure I've seen since I've covered I started covering the Montreal Canadiens in terms no. of a guy who's 30 years old and figures something out psychologically, mm-hmm. overcomes that 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 hurdle, and it seems to all of a sudden unlock the toolbox that is pretty enticing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've seen guys that, that, that reach different levels for one reason or another. But at such a late stage in this, uh, in his career, he's, he's an eight year NHL veteran. And mm-hmm. it's not just a, it's not a matter of points. He's not going to reach his, his, his career high in points this year, maybe is, is in terms of goals. Probably not in terms of points. He would really have to go on serious heat. I guess like no, ass, I guess like no assist this year. He's, he's, yeah, he's but real... you look. It's just the the impact that he's got on the game night after night after night for the past three months. Uh, he's clearly figured something out, and the the way that he's figured it out, I I, I have not seen that in Montreal yeah. since I've started covering that team. Yeah, me too. I actually told him that last night after the game. I said, I don't think I've covered a season as interesting as yours. And I've been covering this team for a very long time. You know, it's like it's – and he's kind of giggled. He kind of chuckled. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it has been. <laughs> it's been pretty interesting. <laughs> it's like – but, um, but yeah, and, you know, I, I think it's uh, – you know, you were, you were mentioning off air or whatever prior to the show how, you know, there's, there's a lot of – You know, the Yule Army has been not been shy to say that he's he's spoken to to JF Bernard about, you know, his the mental side of his performance and, and how that's been kind of the big thing that he's unlocked here. Yeah. Is not allowing the sports psychology side to hamper his performance. And it's a real benefit of the Canadians bringing Bernard aboard. Um, you know, I think the Toronto chapter selected Ilya Samsonov as their candidate. It probably went through a similar type of thing earlier this season where he just looked completely lost on the ice, got sent down, didn't actually go to the Marlies, um, just got to, just got to take a timeout basically. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then came back and has been great for them. Uh, but there's a, a number of candidates this year who went through, you know, actual mental health issues, which is, which is a totally separate thing. It's different. Uh, and more serious, obviously, it's it's you know it impacts your your real life and not just how you perform on a sh- on a sheet of ice. 
Um, you know, we mentioned Drouin, McCarron, Oliver Shillington in, in Calgary, Connor Ingram in, Connor Ingram, man, in Arizona, which was a that, real... That guy's a survivor. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that's uh, a real nice nod to how attitudes toward these kinds of things are changing. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share, cause we've got little bios cause we get to vote on the Masterton and each chapter they vote on their own candidate each. Yeah. Uh, so each group of reporters, there's and 32 then, candidates. That's it. Yeah. So, and then we receive like little bios to just, indicate if you want to further explore someone's n nomination and investigate mm -hmm. further there's a little blurb that comes with it and um i'll read the one of Con on connor ingram because i i think that I i'm pretty good at nailing the masterton every year i think i pick the one who's going to <laughs> to to get oh, it that right okay oh yeah 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 that's that's my superpower Oh, nice. I can name the Masterton in advance. <laughs> Sweet. Because I knew that Christopher Letta would win it, you know, it, it, before, after what, his third or fourth nomination. Anyway. Yeah. So, Connor Ingram. Ingram's career was nearly derailed by undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder, a condition that led him to drink heavily and obsess over the possibility of contamination from physical contact with other people or even everyday objects. Mm -hmm. Four years after entering the NHL NHL PA Player Assistance Program and undergoing intense therapy, and seven years after he turned pro, Ingram has learned to cope with and manage his condition. He has also locked down a regular NHL spot while becoming one of the NHL betters, uh, better con goaltenders. He's been unfailingly open when discussing his condition. He almost took the number one job in Arizona this year from Valmelka. He's been he's been a great he's been story. he's been a great story absolutely and you know I think Jonathan Drouin has also been very open talking about what he went through during the Canadians you know run to the final which he didn't participate mm -hmm. in because he was dealing with some mental health issues and it really has served to you know remove the stigma around mental health uh, and and I hopefully you know, inspired more people to, to try and recognize it in themselves and reach out for help when they need it, you know? And I thought obviously Kerry Price did that when he spoke about his, um, his issues with alcohol. So as openly as he did, um, Michael McCarron, same thing in, in Nashville, he's, he's been talking about his journey, uh, since entering the program, um, also for alcohol. So it's like, it's, it's really, it's nice to see, you know, it's nice to see that this, element of uh of all of our lives but can be reflected through people with such why why with such a visible platforms mm -hmm. and can sort of send that message to people that if uh there's nothing wrong with asking for help and it can it can change your life for the better and these are all examples where that happened and so that's uh That's a very separate thing from Armia and Samsonov. That's, that's, that's mental performance. When it comes to mental health, it's obviously a lot more serious. Uh, and, um, and I think it's, it's, it's a great sign that, that there, we have all these people who, who are coming out the other side of it at the NHL level and are able to show people that you too can come out the other side of it. Uh, if you, if you choose to, to seek the help that, that might be necessary. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's good that the Master Den's not, the greatest comeback from injury the way it was before. Sometimes it's also like the journeyman minor leaguer who figures out a way to crack an NHL lineup at 29 or 30 years old. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, Alex and then there's Belzil others. Was, was there last Alex year. Belzil. Yeah. And then there's, there's, there's the Pittsburgh chapter nominating Sidney Crosby. And I don't know, can you find anyone who is more dedicated to hockey than Sidney Crosby? I don't, I don't think so. So, but it's, again, it's not, You know, his injury issues are, are, are long behind him. Uh, he's, you know, he is a great candidate for this trophy as well. For, you know, if you look at the literal definition of what we're supposed to be kind of judging these guys on, it's perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to hockey. And yeah. Sidney Crosby is all those things. So it's, it's, I, I, the Masterton is one I often find it difficult. To vote for because 
all 32 of these guys. And as mentioned, Sean Monahan not even one of those 32. And so he could be one of those injury comeback story candidates, but you know, they all have their own stories that, that are worth celebrating. And I'm glad that we, the PHWA announces all 32 so that in a way they are celebrated, you know, that they, they were recognized by their local chapters um, for doing what they did this season. And so, yeah, I have, I love voting for that award. I, I you know, it's, it's a lot more fun and uh, involving for me to, to, to vote for that than to vote for the Lady Bing, for example. Well, for sure, the Lady Bing. But I just hate I, – what I hate about it is is not voting for people, is that when people are left off my ballot, you know, like it's – Right, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's the it. part I don't like. like. Yes, I love the fact that we're we're choosing to recognize player one, two, and three. It's yeah. player four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten that are not on the ballot. That kind of bothers me about it. But it's, it's <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. It's a trophy and you have to, you have to pick someone. And so – So Yul Armia is, is, is our candidate in Montreal. Um, congratulations to him. And, you know, another, you know, I kind of wrote about this last night and actually this morning, but, you know, you look at Yul Armia and sorry, that's my dog. You look at Yul Armia and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's been judged based on his contract for a while, you know, and his, his contract has been what's been problematic for him. If he was playing at a league minimum salary, no one would have really cared the last couple of years when, you know, he didn't, he didn't have the consistency he needed and sometimes looked like he was going through the motions. And, and what we now learn is actually the opposite of that, that those times he thought he was going through the motions, he was actually so racked with stress about his own performance that it was actually making him look that way when it was actually the opposite reason. But, you know, the Canes have three other players whose contracts are really – determining how they get judged, you know? And I wonder if Christian Dvorak, Josh Anderson, and Brendan Gallagher can see Yul Armia and what he's done and been like, okay, we can, we can do that too. Like, why don't we, why don't we grab that narrative and make it ours next season? Yeah. But it's, isn't it apple and oranges though, in terms of, because really when it comes to Armia, it's, it's something, there was a, a bit of a, a mental block that he managed to overcome for, I don't know. I don't know enough about Christian Dvorak to really comment, but it seems to me like the challenge facing Anderson and Gallagher is very much physical and hockey related in the sense that we have to figure out ways to adapt our style of play to how the game is played and how our coach wants us to play. Yeah. And in that sense, I feel like Gallagher is, is has done progress that way. He uh, he's not he's never going to be a 30 goal scorer anymore. I think everybody understands that. But he's got to find ways to prolong his career. Uh -huh. And lately, I find that he's been he's been playing decent hockey. It's I'm I've got no issue with you know the the level of effort that he's showing the fact uh, the the intensity in the offensive zone is is impactful in the offensive zone he create things again um so it's really a matter of price tag next to him and say well for that amount of money you should be performing more but to a certain extent that ship has sailed and there's nothing that he can do about it you know it's like that that old Roberto Luongo saying, my contract sucks. Well, Gallagher contract sucks. <laughs> but <laughs> in, at the same time, he has to find ways around it. And uh, there, I, I feel as though if he can adapt and he's in the process of doing it, there, there could be a, a place for him in the, line, uh, in the lineup for, for a few years. The question is, that new, that new definition of Brendan Gallagher – Can he, could he maintain that even if the bar is lowered and the mm -hmm. expectations are lowered, can he sustain that level for three or four years? You know, can he be like a guy that contributes, even if it's on the fourth line, for 11 minutes? He can still be a guy that could be maybe on PP2, uh, who could chip in 15 goals uh, a, a year. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because it's, This is where the bar is now, 
But could, could he maintain that rhythm, especially with the league getting faster and evolving into something new and something something better every year? If he if he just remains the same, uh, he'll he'll be affected by the fact that the rest of the league gets gets better. So I don't know. Do you think that there's well, I would look at for him. Well, I look at the last two games, right? Uh, last night, Gallagher had two assists. Um, the game before, I thought his passing was actually better. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately for him, the guy on the receiving end of those passes was invariably Josh Anderson. He wasn't able to put the puck in the net. He would, could have had three assists in that game against the Panthers, the way Gallagher played Did you say it. say in the net or on the net? He couldn't put the puck in the net. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or on. Right. I think <laughs> that's true. He probably didn't put the puck on the net in several of those cases, but... Um, But yeah, so it's in Gallagher, like, and, and, you know, I've, I, I think I've said it on this podcast. I've long had this theory with Gallagher that he could be Dustin Brown. I finally yeah. talked to him about that, uh, this week, uh, how he could be Dustin Brown. When Dustin Brown signed an eight year contract, I think it was worth 5.75 million or 5.875 or something in that range. Uh, his percentage of the cap at the time was actually higher than Brendan Gallagher's is now. So the contract was richer, even though in monetary terms, it's less than what Gallagher makes. Uh, he, after signing that contract, he signed, he, that contract kicked in a year after he won the Messier leadership award, Dustin Brown. Okay. It was in many ways, a reward for what Dustin Brown had done Two Stanley cups, captain of the team named captain at age 23, like really, was a thank you contract as opposed to a show me contract, which is exactly what Brendan Gallagher got, right? Yeah. Immediately, as soon as that contract kicked in, uh, he signed it the year prior, but as soon as that contract kicked in, Brown's production started to tank. And he was quickly viewed as having the, or one of the worst contracts in the NHL. And then suddenly at age 31, I believe he, uh, He figured something out and he started producing and he had a 28 goal season out of nowhere. And, you know, I went back and actually I reached out to Dustin Brown. He didn't, he didn't get back to me, unfortunately, but is um, I looked back at some quotes from that season and how he, first of all, he came into camp lighter than he had in previous years. So he made a physical adjustment to, the way the game was being played. And there, there were a lot of commonalities that didn't get into my piece, but he was talking about how the game had changed to, um, and, and, you know, stylistically had changed and how he had to adapt to that. And then Gall and Gallagher said the same thing. And again, this wasn't in my piece, but you talked about how when he was having success, team cycled a lot in the offensive zone. And that's something yeah. that he and Deno and Tatar did a lot. They cycled the puck, cycled the puck, cycled the puck and produced chances and funneled to the net. Um, teams don't play in the offensive zone like that anymore. You look at, you know, just from the Canadians standpoint, when Suzuki, Caulfield and Slavkovsky are on the ice, uh, they never cycle the puck. They actually spread out as much as they can. And they try to create space and balance on the ice. And Marty St. Louis always talks about, well, cycling the puck is not balanced. It's actually entirely focused on, on, on one area of the offensive zone. And now there's sort of, there's a shift away from that. And so Gallagher is trying to find ways to succeed in that reality when, you know, the, the former, you know, the former trend of cycling pucks really suited his game. Um, he's never been a particularly good passer. He's never been a particularly good shooter. He's a guy who scores goals much the way he almost scored against Florida. You know, that, that, that puck, that play that was reviewed of him jamming away and that can still be the way he scores goals. I mean, that's never going to change. No matter what stylistic mm -hmm. changes happen in hockey, there's always going to be guys that you want who go to the net and score greasy goals the way he has his whole career. So he can still do that, but he needs to complement that because there's only so many of those opportunities you get in a game. Uh, he needs to complement that with understanding the way the hockey is played now and, and fitting into that. And I think he's doing that and showing, but more so, showing a capacity to do it and showing a willingness to do it. You know, like Marty talked about how the one thing you have to do to kind of extend your career is accept your new reality. Yeah. It's clear talking to Brendan that he's accepted his new reality. There's no, 
you know, he believes he can still be productive, but he also recognizes that he also recognizes that if he never gets back to those even close to those prior levels of production, he needs to diversify his game and make himself valuable in other ways. Um, so he's accepted that, you know, and then you, when you look at Anderson, you know, it's funny, Marty was asked about Anderson and Gallagher on the same day, almost back to back questions. And Marty kind of with Anderson, it wasn't the same kind of thing. It was, it was sort of like, we, we know there's goals in in him, you know, there, there's things in him that will lead to him scoring again. Um, but I think, yes, Anderson needs to make an adjustment, but I think, and I've said it before, I think the Canadians and I think in particular, Marty needs to make an adjustment with Anderson and just be like, you know what, go out and play the way you want to play. And we'll, he said about, he said about Anderson, this season was likely to be a one-off. Yeah. But I think in order for that to happen, there needs to be some give from both sides, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and not have Anderson. You know, not give Anderson too much information. I think he's bogged down by too much information right now. Listen, when I talked to him at the beginning of this month, or actually, sorry, about a month ago now, you know, he said how when he's sitting in the dressing room before games, there's a lot of things going through his head. Like, I'm just thinking about a lot of things. And it was really, he emphasized a lot. You know, like it was really something that seemed to, to bog him down, like situational plays, like where do you have to go when this happens? Where do I have to go when that happens? This, that, and you can see it on the ice. Like at times he's confused. He doesn't know what to do. Whereas before, and he said this himself, he's like before I never thought in the dressing room before a game, because I knew exactly what I was going to go out there and do. I was going to skate up and down the ice as fast as I can. And, uh, and, and hit guys and score goals. And, And like, that's, you know, that's, that was my job. And I did that well. And you look at, you know, the NHL edge stats, like Josh Anderson is still one of the fastest skaters in the league. He has, he's, he's top 10 in, I think it's 22 mile an hour bursts right, this right, season, right, yeah. you know? So he's, he's one, he's a guy who can do that still. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's necessary, but it feels necessary to me that, that maybe this is one where Marty can be like, you know what? What he is is just fine. We don't need to evolve his game. Like, let's just take what we have with him and live with that. And I think, you know, that's what he's done most of this season. Like, he's he's stayed off of Josh Anderson a lot because he has he's going through so much. And, and he's admitted that trying to give him space and room to breathe and all that stuff. You know, maybe that's something they could look at and be like, you know, not everyone, not everyone can uh, – can be taught hockey sense. You know, remember when Marty came on for we, we talked to him the first time after he was hired, this was the big thing that he thinks everyone can be taught hockey sense. Well, maybe, maybe not everyone can. No, but I mean, as just as much as it's true that you have to have like 23 different ways to coach your team mm-hmm. and you have to individualize to a certain extent, although John Tortorello probably would not agree to that. Uh, at the same time, you there's one way. There are concepts that you're teaching so that ultimately the team all plays the same way. Yeah, and you instill a a way of playing that who no matter who you put in the lineup, they all figure it out and they all they all follow the same the same way. Uh, if you exclude one player, saying ah, it's it's not for him, and you just do your thing, can it? Can it remain cohesive? Can he still, def- despite the fact that he would be, he would be playing his game, uh-huh. uh, bringing it in the game, like yes. Marty used to say. Uh, but if 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 the game that is being encouraged by Martin Saint Louis and it's applied by the rest of the team, if it doesn't apply to Anderson, well, can it work? Well, so I did. I was. I did a lot of research on this. On this this whole Gallagher thing. And, you know, when Martin said, we mentioned Jason Spezza as an example of a guy who kind of accepted a lesser role, it doesn't really apply to Gallagher because Spezza sort of accepted that role on a league minimum salary when he signed with the Leafs as a free agent, you know, but he was in Dallas. Uh, he signed a four year deal at 7.5 a year at 31 or 32. Uh, and by year two of that deal, uh, you know, Ken Hitchcock was in Dallas and it just, it, it went south, you know, like he really, 
and at one point was healthy scratched. It was a big thing. Yeah. Um, and so in looking at that, I was reading some of the quotes from back then and Ken Hitchcock mentioned how, well, this line is more of a, a rush line and this line is more of a cycle line. And so we, you know, we don't know where to, so, but he kind of like, he, he gave roles to lines and had yeah. lines that would play a certain way. Now, you know, I'm not saying that that's what has to happen here. I don't even know if Marty would believe in doing that. Um, but they already have the components of a line that could do that. And frankly, we saw it the other night. Like if they had a third line of Anderson, Newhook, and Gallagher and had that be just kind of a straight line, speed, and forechecking line – as a, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, I feel like there's just some give. There needs to be some give on both sides here. Josh Anderson needs to learn some of the things that the Canadians are trying to do with him. And the Canadians need to acknowledge that there's certain things he can't do and that he got bogged down in those things this year and need to avoid that happening again. So does that mean he's like an exceptional case? I don't know, but I think there's a way to, to find a happy medium here where you can get the most out of this player that you're paying $5.5 million a year and who has a skill set that is proven to work in the NHL and um, and build up his value again, hopefully to the point where they could trade him. I mean, it's really because there are teams that Josh Anderson would fit in well on, you know. I think he'd be great on the Panthers. I think he'd be great on the Hurricanes. I think he'd be great on the Canucks, actually. Like, there's, there's a lot of teams – where, oh, it fits so well with the Panthers. You're right. Yeah, like there, yeah. there are a lot of teams who st- or a better stylistic fit for Josh Anderson. The Canadians just need to get him back to a level where those teams can look at him and say, "Yes, we want that at that dollar figure in our lineup." Oh. And with the cap going up, I don't think it's impossible, but they need to build him back up so that he can get to that level where he can get to a team that's that's better suited to his skill set. Well, Gallagher and Anderson are not necessarily at the same point in their career because Gallagher needs to uh, to manage the uh, the regression to a certain extent. Where I don't think that Anderson's at that point yet. But no. when you mention coaching, when it comes to Anderson, I think that that's where it it connects the two because you were comparing Gallagher to Dustin Brown. Uh, the main difference with with Dustin Brown and his resurgence in L.A was that at some point Daryl Sutter was fired. Yeah. And a change in coaching made a huge difference uh-huh. to the fact that all of a sudden he found he found it pleasant to go to the rink again, but it was years of being bogged down by the coach. And all of a sudden, I think it was uh, – well, first Jay uh, – I think first it was uh, John Stevens that uh, that came back on the – Uh, behind the bench, yeah. Well, his resurgent was... year, Stevens was the coach, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, it's just the so similarity well. is that you look at the quotes from that season, like Kopitar saying, you know, Brownie lives around the net. You always need a guy like that. Stevens, guy who goes hard to the net, who guys goes to the dirty areas, always need guys like that. Like, that's Gallagher. You know what I mean? So, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Gallagher sure. doesn't have a coach that's holding him back. Well, No, doesn't have a coach. I mean, I don't think so. I think that there's a buy-in there. That's uh, yeah, that's there's really, a buy-in. They, yeah. they 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 figured it out. Yeah, yeah. But like Brown went through. I mean, Brown had the, the stripping of the captaincy with Brown was 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 a real nasty episode. You know, like he did not appreciate how that all happened. There are stories that came out. Like there's stories off the conference call he gave after that decision. And his comments are like he was coming back from a place where he just kind of felt the whole organization had turned its back on him. You know, it wasn't against anything against Andre Kopitar, but that was another kind of key element for him was kind of removing that pressure and, and sort of allowing him to focus on himself a little more than he did as captain, where he was kind of focused on the whole team, uh, was another factor in him being able to kind of have that resurgence. So there's obviously, there's obviously details in each story that are going to be different you know it's like it's just yeah. You're just looking generally. for comparisons and, and inspirations too you know say okay well if the guy can d- did it then well maybe i can do it on my side it's just you need to uh you need to find points where it's relatable to your situation and you can you can get motivation out of that 
Yeah. Um, All right. Hey, let's go do a uh, let's go to Future Friday just because I want to hear the Future Friday uh, jingle. <laughs> Future Friday. Okay, so Future Friday today, we decided that we would talk a little bit about the situation with the uh, Lyon de Trois-Rivières, the Trois-Rivières Lions, who are owned by uh, the same man and same company who also own the Newfoundland Grounders, Growlers, sorry, um, who were recently disbanded and, and ceased operations in the middle of the season. Um, so why don't you, the Trois-Rivières, got another lease on life. So why don't you kind of bring right. bring everyone up to date on, on what's going on there? Yeah. So, well, first off, I think that the the project of having an ECHL in, in Trois-Rivières was very interesting and it, for the Canadians uh, to have like that second affiliate there. So it's a good, good news that they managed at least to finish the season and, and mm -hmm. potentially to survive in, in Trois-Rivières. So, uh, they've been there since 20, the 21, 22 season in a brand new building, Colise the Videotron Coliseum in, in Trois Rivières. So you had this guy from Deacon Sports and Entertainment called Dean McDonald. As you said, you had both of these franchises, the Growlers and the Lions. And, uh, he ran into debt pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and basically, there was uh there, there was unpaid rent unpaid lease to the city um and, and and he ran into debt so they were either he had to pay off his his debt or the league was ready to just basically shut down the team mm -hmm. on april the 2nd uh there were discussions uh with different entities so that dean mcdonald would be able uh to uh, to sell the lions to uh to to new um a new property uh you remember you, you, there's this uh this company we see the ads on 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 tv fix auto well fix auto is seems to be this big company that has a sports branch and uh, that there okay. that sports entertainment branch uh was in negotiations to buy the lions mm -hmm. and uh it it fell through uh, for one one, year, one reason or another with the case uh, case the depot anyway so there's this um late last week there was this american investor that showed up and said i'm interested i'm going to buy the team so the guy paid he paid the city six hundred thousand dollars out of the close to million dollars that uh the lions owed to the city of trois rivières uh for these the, that unpaid rent um so and now he's in the process a transaction is not is not completed yet it needs so legal approval still, right yeah yeah well yeah, yeah. and it, so the transaction is not it doesn't have full control yet for now the lions are under the chl's guardianship ECHL, but yeah. yeah so he's going but eventually the understanding is that uh, he's going to become like the main, the principal owner of the Lions. Uh, the, the city wants to attract local investors to support that new owner. Uh -huh. And the, the, the feeling in Trois Rivières is that that new owner will keep, despite the fact that he's American, he's going to keep the team where it is and he's not going to move it somewhere else. The, the growlers in Newfoundland were not so lucky, uh, because the fact that it's so far, it's so remote from everywhere. Uh -huh. Uh, there, there are expenses that come with operating the growlers that have come to uh, bite uh, Mr. McDonald in the bum and, and any potential owner at this point. And I talked to uh, Alex Newhook about that uh, yeah. a couple of days ago, obviously being one of the few Newfoundlanders in the NHL. And, you know, he, he saw, he grew up at a time where there, he saw three different teams leave uh newfoundland one after the other you know in the queue there used to be the fog devils yeah. uh there was an american league that was briefly the canadians affiliate the ice caps mm -hmm. and now you got the growlers so three levels of hockey that bolted one after the other because it's just too too expensive to operate well you have to travel uh, by plane 
You have no choice Constant, but to travel yeah. by plane. Yeah, exactly. And and the rest of the league won't send you any, uh, you know, any any rescue mission because no. there is expenses for them too to just go to you. Yeah, uh, exactly. So. So the growlers basically had to fold because there was no uh, there was no option to uh, to keep them alive. But Trois Rivières, luckily, is able to continue its operations, and it's it hasn't been a huge success, right? At the gate, uh, the lions have the second to last worst average um, uh, when it comes to attendance in the whole of ECHL. I was surprised to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. Granted, it's not a huge building. Uh, I think it's it's four four thousand five hundred something like that. But they they're they're under three thousand on average per game. And you got other teams like in Jacksonville, for example, that are like close to eight thousand. So right. there's big disparity. Um, so there's still a lot of building up and and building um, solid foundations for that team. Uh, I, I thought that maybe the Montreal Canadiens would be involved financially. I checked with Jeff Molson and he said that, you know, before it was disclosed that it was this American uh, mm -hmm. investor, uh, I, I bumped into Jeff and I asked him, are you the one who's paying the $600,000? He said, no, 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 it's going to, it's, it's some dude from the U.S. Uh, but I think that, you know, originally the ECHL, the idea was to say, well, if every five years, we could come up with a David de Arne type, a guy that it basically is found money, is a guy that fell in the cracks and through the ECHL can become a legitimate prospect for the Montreal Canadiens organization and eventually become a Montreal Canadiens player. Uh, you know, I named de Arne, but a, a guy like Brett Kulak also went through the ECHL. There are, there's a mm -hmm. bunch of those guys. There's a lot of them. Alex uh, Burrows. Exactly. Great example. Yeah. So, uh, if if one every five years you can find one of those players in itself, it justifies investing in a product that otherwise can serve as a funnel to all those players that graduate from the queue that are like Quebec players that can use the ECHL as a starting point. But it so far yeah. it doesn't suggest as though it has it has gone that way. But again, it's a it's a team that's only three years old, so it it needs a bit more runway to come to uh, to fruition. Well, I think I think what needs to I think what needs to be made clear here, and what what the Trois Rivières organization needs to understand is that yes, they are a Canadians affiliate, but they are an independent hockey club. You know, the Canadians own and operate the Laval Rocket. Um, they're going to treat that differently than they do the ECHL. They have an affiliation agreement with the ECHL team. It's not their team. Um, I think there was a lot of disappointment from some of the early management coaching staff. The the, the, the organization in trois I think, expected the Canadians to be more involved than they were. Uh, the Canadians kind of looked at it as you're an affiliate, but you are in charge of running the team. Um, we will send you players here and there, but we're not, you know, we're not, we're, we're not, not going to get weaker to get you stronger. Well, exactly. Yeah. Like there were, <laughs> there, there was, there was a belief that, you know, maybe if Laval's out of it and we're trying to make a playoff spot that you'll send us some players and help us and whatever. And, and that was never the case. And that was ne like from the outset, that was never going to be the case. Um, it does benefit the Canadians to have a pool of players available so close by, um, Laval obviously goes through 40, 40 players a year, roughly. Um, you know, instead of having to sign these guys last minute or go scouring the ECHL looking for them, it's good to have them right there. Yeah. You know, like John Parker Jones, for instance, who's like a perfect kind of tweener guy who, who can play in the AHL, is better suited for the ECHL. We have him right there. If you need him, he's, you know, a two hour drive away. So it's, it's, it's beneficial in that respect. And, and what you mentioned, obviously, is that if you, if you get one guy, uh, and the Leafs have often, you know, what Leafs under Kyle Dubas, you know, the whole, the whole existence of the Growlers comes as a result of the Leafs trying to build a baseball style, vertically integrated right. development pl platform, basically, or a development system where you have the equivalent of double AAA and, you know, MLB, um, 
for hockey. And so they put a lot of resources into building that team, you know, and like, and, and, and they were a lot more involved, I think, in the Growlers than the Canadians were with the Lions. And maybe that's where that expectation came from. Uh, but for the Lions to succeed, I think that that's what, and, and, and that's why I applaud them looking for local investors because it needs to be its own thing. They can't expect the Canadians don't seem all that interested in be, being sort of the father figure of the organization. Yes, they will serve as an affiliate. Yes, they benefit from it, but it needs to be its own thing, um, marketed as its own thing and, and, and operated as its own thing um, in order for it to succeed. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They have, they have to be able to uh, fly. Voler de ses propres ailes. I don't know what's the, if there's an English, English equivalent for that expression, but yeah. There is. I just, in. there is. It just escapes me right now, but okay. yeah, there is, but okay. my but yeah, mind, my mind is not ready to, to, to come up with it. That yeah. But that success has to be independent and it's got, it's got to be a, a, a local success too. It's got to yeah. be. Well, you, you talk about the attendance. I mean, it's, that's an issue, you know, and that's an issue I think that's solvable. Like if you make that team, uh, And, and it'll take time too. It's not like, uh, but you know, generally the first three years of any professional sports franchise, you, you benefit from the, the newness of that team yeah. and the curiosity factor. Um, but the challenge is to bring those people back and look at what's happening in Winnipeg right now. You know, that's the newness is gone. The team's competitive and they're, they're struggling at the gate. You know, it's like, it's, it's really a constant battle. Um, to keep yourself relevant in your own market um, yeah. in such a gate driven league, you know, like the, the so Twilight Dad needs to make sure that they make themselves a viable, competitive entertainment option in Twilight Dad um, and not think that the Canadians are going to come and rescue them every time they need some help. You know, like they just got to, they have to operate on their, and you know, as you said, which I don't know why I can't come up with the English equivalent. I'm I don't sure, know. I don't know. Sure You're the there will be between like, the two of us. I'm sure there will be <laughs> 25 million comments on the YouTube page telling me exactly the expression I can't think of right now, but, but that's all what needs caps, to happen. Please. Yeah. All yeah. caps. Give all caps. Lots of, and feel free to swear. Um, but, and also the one that, one thing I'd like to just in, in, in wrapping red on that topic is that, When you try to attract players, even at such a slow, uh, low level as the ECHL, uh, you have to offer a path forward, a path up for these players. Uh -huh. So if you want to have a good team, you have to draw good players. And the good players for that level have to see a way up for themselves. And the challenge for the Lions is that when you look at the Canadians and then the Rocket, They're both very young teams. So the Rocket is full, full of young players uh, that are going to be there for a while and they're just, you know, uh, working their, 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 their craft in order to become bona fide NHL players in some, in some cases. So if you're an ECHL player and the way up is the Laval Rocket, finding a spot to showcase yourself and force your way in is probably more difficult Then on a more seasoned American League team, where there there, there will be a look for um, some some new blood for younger players, uh, so it's, I think that adds to the challenge. And uh, so far, it's uh, yeah, it's it. I think to a certain extent, because there are guys that have been going up and down from the Lions to the the Rocket and and the, the other way around. Nolan Yaremko, Strassman, the goalie. Uh -huh. I think the ECHL is a good place for goalies. It's a good, uh, you know, a good starting point for goalies. But um, it's hard when you're, if even if you're performing in the ECHL level, to showcase yourself in an environment where there's so many prospects in the AHL. So to that, I would say this kind of in conclusion that, um, so this is kind of apropos of nothing, but I was, uh, when I was in Vancouver, I was talking to a pro scout about uh about a bunch of things. And, and that was right around the time that Reinbacher was arriving in Laval. And I mentioned it to him and we got to talking about the Laval rocket. This guy had seen a bunch of rocket games. He says, it's like, you know who I have time for on that team that I read that really surprised me. But the more I saw him, the more I liked him. 
is that Bisson guy. So he's mm-hmm. talking about Toby Bisson, who is David Reinbacker's D partner in Laval. So Toby Bisson, after playing uh, the full complement, the full limit of years in the QMJHL, uh, went to the Cincinnati Cyclones out of the QMJHL in 2018-19, uh, played 70 games for the Cyclones, got one game with the Rochester Americans that year, obviously undrafted in CNHL, went back to the Cincinnati Cyclones in 2019-20, played 62 games, got 22 points, and was signed by the Laval Rocket the following year, 2020-21. And has been there, well, not actually ever since, played two seasons in Laval, one season in Ontario, uh, the Kings affiliate in the AHL, back in Laval this year, and has caught the eye of at least this one NHL pro scout. So there is a path from the ECHL, maybe to the fringes of the NHL, but to becoming a solid AHL veteran player. And if Bissell continues on this path, maybe he won't become an NHL player, even if he is attracting some attention from NHL scouts. But if you become like a solid AHL veteran, you can make a pretty good living doing that in the AHL. Um, and so, yeah, I would say yeah, you but do the point need is to about pres- getting it's a, the point is getting an, a, a, a two way contract, a, 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 you know, an NHL AHL contract. Yeah. That's that's Bisson's goal. Yeah. But the Montreal Canadiens in their situation, I don't know if they're going to be in a position to to offer him that sort yeah, of deal. Yeah, but they've offered him uh, a platform to get noticed yeah. enough to get that kind of deal, is, is my point. So yeah. it's it's definitely – and it and the thing is that when you have a team full of prospects, the one thing that your team gets is scouted. <laughs> you have a lot of scouts watching those prospects, and that's the way you can get seen. So – Um, it's obvious, it's apparently true for Bissell, uh, good for him that, uh, he's had a great season and, and, and every AHL team needs guys like that. And if, uh, if he lands a two-way contract somewhere, probably not in Montreal, you're right, but somewhere, then that's, that's a path from the ECHL to at least an AHL contract, which, you know, oftentimes those two-way deals come with AHL minimums that are pretty high. You know, so like uh, Belzil's AHL minimum right now with the Rangers is 500K, if I'm not mistaken. And so that's, and plus he has, a, I think his, his contract shifts to a one way next year, um, which is why the Canadians couldn't, uh, or I, I should say, chose not to uh, to compete with the Rangers to sign him. So, yeah. There is a well, path. I, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, Bisson, if he, if he manages to get a, a, a two way deal, I think we we discussed his case you and I before, and I said, he, why couldn't he be like a Corey Schooneman, where he gets a few few NHL games, you know, potentially? And there's well, there's you need the right path. situation. You need the right. I mean, you That's know, right. Corey Schooneman would not play, would never get a Canadiens game with the Canadiens now. Um, no. There's too many young defensemen. There's more coming. It's you know, so it's and you know, probably for Bissell to to take the next step in his career, he will probably have to leave the organization, but. They've given him a window um, and a platform to do that. Yeah, there's one guy who graduated from the uh, the Lions to the the Laval Rocket. It's Riley McKay, right. rugged rugged forward. So he played uh, two years ago in. Uh, well, he he split the year last year between Trois Rivières and 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 Laval, and this year he's been playing solely with the Rocket. Yeah. Oh. All right, so I didn't. I never thought I would talk about Riley McKay on this podcast, but here we are, and uh, that's it. For- <laughs> uh-huh. no, well, you know, that's what happens when you when we decide to talk about the Trois Rivières Lions. But you know, once in a, yeah, it had to be brought up. It was in the news this week. I think it, it was it was warranted to be just a yeah. It's also what happens when you, when when you ramble on for an hour and a half like we just did. So <laughs> that's that's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> But thanks for listening, right, for those of you, for those of you who made it. the end. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We'll be back on uh, Monday after Saturday's game. Oh, God, the Canadians have a double header. Uh, they play they play Toronto on Saturday and in uh, New York on Sunday. So that's going to be quite a challenge. Uh, big, big weekend uh, coming up. And we're going to talk to you on Monday. So don't hesitate to send us your questions uh, on our mail uh, for our mailbag. Uh, you can reach us on X at Basu and Godin or write longer, more detailed emails at Basu and, uh, Basu and Godin at gmail.com. <laughs>